Hello and welcome to podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. When you're ready to launch your next app or want to try out a project you hear about on the show, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so take a look at our friends over at Linode. With the launch of their managed Kubernetes platform, it's easy to get started with the next generation of deployment and scaling, powered by the battle-tested Linode platform, including simple pricing, node balancers, 40 gigabit networking, dedicated CPU and GPU instances, and worldwide data centers. Go to pythonpodcast.com slash linode today, that's L-I-N-O-D-E, and get a $60 credit to try out a Kubernetes cluster of your own. And don't forget to thank them for their continued support of this show. Your host as usual is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Nick Barrett about PyInfra, a pure Python framework for agentless configuration management. So Nick, can you start by introducing yourself? Hi, oh, yeah. Thanks for having me, and thank you for listening. I'm Nick Barrett. I'm a software engineer working at a company in the retail analytics space where I focus on kind of infrastructure heavy projects. I also run a couple of side projects under the Oxygem brand and spend way too many hours on open source projects in addition. (laughs) And do you remember how you first got introduced to Python? Yeah, so I actually started Python quite late. I started maybe 14 years ago with the kind of classic PHP, HTML, WordPress stack, fiddling with my own kind of blog, a little bit of the internet. And then moved on to Lua in Gary's mod of all places, the game Gary's mod of all places. Before, this was all pre-university. And then even at university, we did, you know, Java and the, the big, big slow ones. And eventually, after university, at the, at the well, I started working professionally. Then I moved into picking up Python. Uh, and I instantly fell in love with the language. And ever since, kind of, as I said, the rest is history. And so that has ultimately led you down the road of building your own configuration management framework. So can you give a bit more background about what PyInfra is and some of the origin story and what led you to build it in the first place? Absolutely. So PyInfra is a tool for managing infrastructure. It's designed to support both ad hoc command execution and kind of full state or configuration management. uh, So it started back... When I, sorry, when I first started working professionally, we used a lot of Ansible and a kind of bit of Fabric, uh, both of which I love, both also written in Python. And they were kind of, they're kind of like the basis of the inspiration for PyInfra. The real, the kind of thing that it kicked, gave me the kick to, to start building PyInfra was um, we were, the infrastructure was growing rapidly. As we grew, Ansible became quite slow and frustrating to use over large numbers of servers. I do recall a a kind of infrastructure-wide deploy we had to set up. I believe it was Sensu at the time, um, which which involves uploading a whole bunch of files uh, onto each server. And basically, as this as the infrastructure grew, this, this became exponentially slower. It got to the point where it would take kind of 20, 30 minutes just to run one you know one rollout of updated uh, Sensu scripts at the time. Uh, we also were using, as I mentioned, Fabric, which was which was still super fast, and we kind of occasionally would kind of mix a bit of Ansible and Fabric to you know Fabric to do the kind of the bits that Ansible was slow at, and Ansible to do the initial install and, and configuration management side of which it is so good. So essentially, I took the my favorite bits of Fabric, uh, the, its speed and its kind of pure Python configuration with the state management concepts and ideas from Ansible. And that's how I hacked together um, PyM for 0.1. And as you mentioned, there's Ansible, which is pre-existing, and you highlighted some of the challenges and pain points there. And there are a number of other options, both in Python and other languages for configuration management that have different layers of complexity and various options in terms of the ways that you approach it. And I'm wondering what the core goals are of PyInfra and some of the capabilities that it offers that might lead some to choose that over other options such as Ansible or SaltStack or Chef or Puppet. Absolutely. So I think for me, the, uh, the for part of the reason of building Python for the kind of greatest benefit is in is in debugging capability, particularly due to the way Python for works. So it kind of roughly executes shell commands uh, in the in the same way that you would if you were kind of setting up a server by hand. And this kind of leads nicely into when something does go wrong. You get instead of getting a like a bespoke kind of error traceback specific to you know the software, you just get essentially the standard out or the standard error in, in, as it should be from the the command that failed during the deploy. So I think this is a 
this is a huge like it's just instant feedback so you get instant debugging feedback so it means you can kind of rapidly iterate through a through building out a deploy or a set of deploys with this in mind and the other the other big win is the pure python configuration of Pineford, which is a uh, which kind of enables almost infinite possibilities as everything is configured in python this allows you to integrate with with basically any python package that already exists so you if you need to pull in like a bunch of ec2 hosts from aws you can just use boto3 and, and integrate that or if you need to pull in secrets from hashicorp vault you can just use the sort of standard python libraries for that and so none of that needs to be built into python for itself it's kind of out of the box compatible with more or less everything that Python is compatible with. So for somebody who is trying to build that infrastructure, there are a number of different ways that you can go about it, different levels of complexity in terms of what you're trying to deal with. And I'm wondering what your major pain points are in terms of dealing with the infrastructure that you're working on and some of the shortcomings that you see in terms of just the overall approach to tooling or system available systems architectures and how you're trying to tackle that with PyInfra and your own work. So I think I previously mentioned the, well, we talk about the other tools one of the certainly one of the pain points I've experienced is the the abstraction that tools ap- apply over the top of, of what's going on un, under the hood, and so they hide away, they they can hide away the kind of underlying commands or, or changes being made to a server, which is great when they work fine and, and they get the end result and the state is as defined in the uh, playbook or role or whatever. But when it doesn't work, you it's much harder to pick out exactly how and why this has failed which leads to kind of kind of can leads kind of unknowns in the infrastructure as it were if that makes sense and i think there's another another pain point which is kind of unrelated to pine for to be honest is uh, i think resource creeps a real issue that i've experienced kind of where if you've especially if you've got like a bunch of cloud providers and maybe some dedicated servers thrown in there you know across a whole bunch of data centers it's really easy to essentially lose servers and you occasionally you know might find like an old box just lying around which is not only a a waste of money but obviously becomes a security hole after a certain period of time when instantly if you don't know about it and it's still attached to your kind of networking infrastructure yeah there's definitely a lot of different complications in trying to approach infrastructure management and just all of the interconnectedness of the systems after you get them up and running makes it very difficult to try and think about them from the initial starting point and how to go from zero to a fully working system in a relatively straightforward progression so yeah absolutely and for somebody who is using PyInfra to be able to configure their servers can you just talk through the overall workflow for actually creating the deployment logic and working with PyInfra and figuring out how to go from the local development to the production environment yeah absolutely so this kind of i mean back so when when i first built PyInfra it was Essentially, use a vagrant machine, sort of, a, you know, bring up a local vagrant VM, and then and then write the deploy logic and, and execute that against the machine, and and effectively manually verify that the deployment has completed, and then you know once it's suitably passing, roll that onto production. And I think as of point nine, point eight, there's Python for now integrates directly with Docker, so you can so obviously all the avoids all the overheads of the Vagrant VM. So it becomes extremely easy to rapidly iterate endlessly, basically bring, building Docker container over and over again using Pine for it, which, which has a nice benefit of you can quite easily write some quick tests to verify that the contents of said container it, you know, matches the, the state defined in your deploy logic. I am also keen to kind of expand this. There's a cool project called Test Infra, which I became aware of recently, which kind of allows you to write unit tests for for tools like PyInfra and Ansible and Salt and so on. And I'm looking forward to integrating PyInfra into that because I think that would be really awesome to be able to write like you know full unit tests for that. Yeah, I've used TestInfra for my own work and definitely appreciate being able to use it. And I've actually written a custom integration with salt stack so that you can write the test in for tests using the salt stack yaml syntax and then it'll do the translation for you behind the scenes which huh. is ugly to look at but useful when you're actually using it yeah that's awesome yeah it's, it's a really cool project and i'm yeah i've kind of only just come on my radar but i'm really looking forward to getting into it yeah and i also appreciate your efforts to use 
PyInfra for being able to build Docker containers so that you can free yourself from the <laughs> Docker file that I personally <laughs> don't like the approach of, but it has gotten us thus far. So uh, <laughs> I'll yeah. try not to denigrate it too much. <laughs> I agree. I yeah, I really struggle with the Docker file. Some days I kind of like the, the the lack of being able to have logic or uh, you know complex logic in there, but some days it's very frustrating and the hacks that have to be used to kind of get past it. So I mean that was partly the inspiration for for integrating Python with Python through a Docker. But yeah, it's kind of a strange concept, like building a Docker container, you know, an image and then turning that like from a from a kind of configuration management tool rather than a Docker file. Um, but it, it works pretty well. So the other thing that you mentioned is that PyInfra has support for being able to handle item potency of the deployments so that you don't have to worry about running at multiple times. And I'm wondering what your approach is for enforcing that in the different operations being performed and some of the things that you have to address in the built-in operators to be able to ensure that it does have that item potency support or edge cases that people who are customizing PyInfra need to look out for in terms terms of handling item potency. Yeah. So it's a really interesting subject to spit like Pyamphras I'll explain the approach and then, then we'll go from there. The essentially Pyamphra achieves other potency by executing deploys in a kind of two phases. The first during the first phase, which is read only, Pyamphra will kind of read state from the server, you know, where's this file, what what packages are installed, blah blah blah. Um, and and then this is compared in the operations with the state defined by the user or, or within the deploy logic. And then finally, PyInfo will spit out the commands required to alter that state to the one uh, you know defined, defined by the user. And so by doing this, it means you, you run it first time, it executes them as normal. And then the second time you run it, nothing, you know, nothing will happen because there's nothing to change. There are some operations that don't follow this. For example, there's a, a server.shell operation, which, which literally just executes a, a, any shell commands you give it. Obviously, this this there's no state to compare there, so that that command would execute every time. In pretty much every configuration tool, there is the option to just run this bash script, and then you're yeah. <laughs> on your own as far as ensuring <laughs> that it's not going to break every time you run it. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's an interesting one. Yeah, there's there's a kind of there's an additional edge case with this because of the two. This is this is where I think Python for differs to like Ansible and stuff, where they do the the check the check whether the state is right kind of all on the machine during during execution phase because Python for does not does it in a two phase and uh, and allows you to essentially dry run it uh, to see what changes would be made. It does mean that operations you, you almost have to consider them independent of others to be fully idempotent, which is obviously kind of a load of nonsense. Realistically, like for example, like one, one good example is if you install nginx using apt and then you want to remove the default site uh, or the link you know the the sim link to the default site configuration the if you do that in pine for without uh, a kind of if you just call the two operations apt install and um files.link with present equals false it will it will install nginx as expected but then when it gets to the files.link operation it won't do anything because at the time of the first phase that file never existed so pine is going to assume not well not pine for doesn't know it's there and therefore doesn't know to delete it so i've included there's a number of kind of hint options in PyInfra in, in certain operations. So you can get the output of the call to app.packages with installing Nginx, and then you can, based on the output, it'll tell you whether something's changed or not. And so if something has changed, i.e. it's installed Nginx, you can then pass the assume present argument to the files.link operation, which will ignore or not check whether the, the link exists and, and kind of issue that removal based on the Nginx change. Digging deeper into PyInfra itself, can you talk through how it's implemented and some of the overall design and implementation changes that it's gone through since you first began working on it and as you started to use it yourself and expose it for use by other people? Yeah, absolutely. I think obviously I just mentioned the kind of two-phase deploy. The two-phase deploy goes way back to the very beginning uh, and it is... Yeah, core to the the way PyInfra works, and this is implemented essentially by a, there's a core API that run that kind of links everything together, and then the main two kind of objects, if you like, are um, facts and operations. So operations are used by users to describe the desired state. Um, you know, ensure this file is here, install this package, and facts kind of describe 
the current state on the remote side, i.e. this file doesn't exist or these apps packages are installed. And so Pyon for basically, oh, sorry, operations use these facts to figure out what needs to change to match the state defined in the operation. And then that is essentially the first phase. And at the end of that, you end up with um, essentially a bunch of commands to run per individual target host. And uh, when I say command, I mean either a shell, a standard shell command or something like a file upload, a file download, or a Python callback. So once phase one is complete, and you've got this list, Pyinfra essentially just executes that by default, operation by operation, and going through each operation and oper uh, executing each of the host's commands as it goes. So that's the that's kind of execution phase. And another kind of key part of Pyinfra, and this is this is a much more recent addition, uh, is the idea of connectors. So Pyinfra was built up using POSIX servers only, um, and SSH was basically the only thing it connected to for a long time. And then that's going to change recently with the addition of things like the Docker connector and the Vagrant connector. These get these essentially define how commands are executed, and it makes for a, a very pluggable system. For example, there is also a, a WinRM Windows Remote Management connector, which is which is in Pine for now. It's kind of very very early stages, but it's it's cut. That's the kind of flexibility this system will will allow. <laughs> This portion of podcast.init is brought to you by Datadog. Do you have an app in production that is slower than you like? Is its performance all over the place, sometimes fast and sometimes slow? Do you know why? With Datadog, you will. You can troubleshoot your app's performance with Datadog's end-to-end -end tracing, and in one click, correlate those Python traces with related logs and metrics. Use their detailed flame graphs to identify bottlenecks and latency in that app of yours. Start tracking the performance of your apps with a free trial at pythonpodcast.com slash datadog. If you sign up for a trial and install the agent, Datadog will send you a free t-shirt to keep you comfortable while you keep track of your apps. And as you've been building out PyInfra, what are some of the libraries that have been essential to being able to make it happen and some of the prior art that you've looked at as either positive or negative examples to learn from? From the library perspective, G-Event is the absolutely at the core of Pinefront. I'm, I'm an absolute raving mad fan of G-Event uh, as a library. Um, it's uh, Obviously, Python 3 has somewhat um, reduced the need for it with native uh, async, but G-Event is not only the API of G-Event. I, I think it's better than async IO, but it's also it's definitely quicker. I, I think it's a, a truly wonderful library to use. And although the only downside, of course, is the kind of monkey patching part, which is kind of a bit hacky, but I like it. I mean, I've been using Pyon for in, in, on production workloads for like four years now, uh, all of which has used GeoVent. And so I'm, I, I'm not concerned from that perspective, if you see what I mean. And the other the other kind of major library that uses would be, sorry, two libraries would be Ginger2 for templating. Uh, which is kind of the same as Ansible and uh, and Salt, I believe both use it, and also Click uh, for the CLI, which I think is another absolutely fantastic bit of bit of code. Yeah, those are definitely useful and ubiquitous libraries, and both of them from the mind of Armin Ronecker, who has also brought us yeah. Flask and many other good things. Indeed, yeah. And so the other interesting piece to dig into is the set of operations that you've built into PyInfra for being able to perform the basis of item potency and sort of define the available functionality for interfacing with the different system aspects of the servers that you're trying to build out. I'm wondering how you have determined which pieces need to be built and just the overall interface of being able to define new operations and add them into the runtime of PyInfra. Yeah, so the the core, oh, this, I mean, this is, yeah, I remember looking at, I remember, still remember, like when I was first kind of figuring out PyInfra, what was, what was the kind of baseline, what's the minimum you need to sort of uh, configure a server on a, you know, in a reasonable way. And so it comes down to like the kind of file file system for all for all kind of file system like you know managing files directories line lines in files links and upload and download files that kind of, that's kind of essential to, I think to any configuration management system or even any kind of in, uh, infrastructure management system and then there's the server side stuff or it, it's called server and the server module environment from not 
I don't know whether that's the, the right terminology, but of user management, group management, um, you know, little things like managing the host name, managing CCTO entries, managing the loaded kernel modules and so on. So that's kind of the, those are like those two are the kind of real core, core kind of set of operations that I would say most are like that are used most by any deployer that I've seen. And then on top of that, there's kind of the more tool specific, command specific ones. So like app uh, for managing app repositories and, and installing app packages and then yum, the same thing. And they were, they were essentially the only two I implemented at the beginning because that was the only, they were the only, the only ones I needed, but has now expanded. I think there's DNF, Brew, APK, there's a you know, whole bunch of them, which is cool. And, and a lot of them implemented by contributors, which is absolutely fantastic. So as far as, as far as, in, uh, so as far as developing additional operations, there's a, the documentation contains a page on this. It's re, it's reasonably simple it's it's basically just a matter of creating a python function and uh, with a decorator to flag it as an operation that takes a state and a host object and then whatever key and whatever arguments the keyword arguments you want and then normally these operations are actually they, t- they turn out to be really quite simple functions because they just you know they they'll read some state from the host by the way of facts so they'll call you know host dot stop and then depending on the what that state looks like they'll basically issue some shell commands is, is kind of general how it looks. So it's actually, it makes for quite a, quite a simple implementation from an operation perspective. So the, 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 should, the, should be quite easy to write, which I think is a real, a good thing. Yeah, reducing the amount of information and understanding that you need to have to be able to plug in something new is definitely beneficial, particularly for a new framework that's trying to gain adoption, where I know that, for instance, with things like Salt, there's a lot of power there, but the amount of understanding that you need to have about how the system works to be able to contribute a new module is fairly substantial. And so there's a fairly high barrier to entry before you can really even get started adding new code to it. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I think that's a, uh, because I've, I've looked at Ansible modules as well, and it's the kind of same thing, like they're much more complex, uh, which is partly just as good as the way they're executed. But yeah, I, do, I think it's a real advantage of, of Pine for that it, it's, if it's accessible, should we say, without, you know, a huge effort expended in learning it. And then another interesting thing that I saw as I was looking through the documentation is that you have the operation modules that allow you to execute these various shell commands, but you also mentioned the ability to execute Python code via PyInfra and using some of the ecosystem libraries. I'm wondering how you handle the execution of those functions on the remote hosts when you're not shipping the external dependencies in the Python runtime to that server and just what the overall flow looks like in the code level of how that works. So the, the key here is actually the, they're not executed on the, they are ex- executed on the local host uh, of the user's, the user's computer. So they, they bypass that in a sense, uh, essentially the actual execution of, of Python functions dur- during a deploy run locally, which means obviously your local virtual environment can have all the all your requirements as such as stored. So Python for itself will not run Python on the remote side. In fact, it won't run anything bar, uh, but by default, by the kind of default shell is the only requirement on the other side, and it c- can be any shell. It kind of bypasses it by running them, running them locally, if you like, which means you can run them within your inventory file or within the deploy file. But the, the kind of real use of the callback uh, operations is that you can, within the within the Python callback, even though it's running locally, you can still execute and, and receive output from the remote host. So there's a, a virtual network software called Zero Tier, which uh, you like install it by apt, apt repository, and it will, it brings itself up and it basically puts a, an identifier, a, you know, unique identifier on the file system. And you need this identifier to authorize the machine within over the zero tier UI to join your kind of network. So one way of achieving that is you, you have a Python, a callback function within PyInfra. And after you do the install and within that function, you basically cat that file out, collect it back in your in your function and then just call the zero tier API. So that allows you to kind of, obviously not executing anything on the remote server, but you you can dynamically speak and, and collect output from the remote server 
kind of mid deploy and within within the context of a function. And beyond the operations, you also mentioned the different uh, execution contexts for interfacing with Docker versus POSIX. But what are some of the other extension points that exist for being able to plug into PyInfra and add different capabilities or functionality? I mean, there's kind of three areas currently of extension. There's the connectors, as you just mentioned. Terraform is an example of one that could be built, and there's, there is actually an issue open for it. But, you know, essentially read a TF state file uh, and turn that into an inventory and then execute against that inventory um, would be one example. Then there are facts. It's, you can write facts, custom facts quite easily. They're just Python classes with two like a command methods and a process methods. These can be written and then used without actually adding them into PyInfra. So if you, you know, you could write bespoke set of facts and operations as well. And these could all be stored in like, you know, a bespoke package or whatever you wanted really. And then call within PyInfra. And that's that's kind of extending PyInfra is today. And then the the kind of the other area where there's a lot more potential, I think, is kind of PyInfra's API, which it, which is fully fledged and, and in existence, but not currently stable. And uh, well, there's, it's fairly stable, but there's no guarantees against that stability yet. This is something I'm targeting for version 1.1 to have a kind of stable API with kind of semantic versioning guarantees. I think this the API could offer some really interesting integrations. It would allow you to execute PyInfra deploys from within almost any context rather than just being a, a CLI, which could learn up some really interesting work in the future. I know on the back of my mind, one thing I really want to do over the coming months is is build a, a really lightweight PyInfra agent, um, which would allow PyInfra to run in a similar manner to kind of salt agent or chef agent, that kind of thing, which would obviously I mean allow enable running PyInfra in, a, in an agent-based manner as well as it's kind of native agentless. For people who are adopting PyInfra, what are some of the edge cases or points of confusion that they should be aware of or that you see them commonly experience? This is a really interesting one, actually. As of today, there's there's one major gotcha I see, which is the idempotency thing we talked about earlier, where operations rely on each other. This can be a bit of a gotcha because it requires thinking about the like each operation is almost individual and then any dependencies between operations have to be essentially almost manually reconciled by by uh, kind of receiving the output of one operation and, and then using that to infer the arguments you pass into the next operation. Unfortunately, this is somewhat the, the, the nature of the kind of two-step deploy and there is some and on my to-do list more documentation around this and kind of examples of it because it is it is quite rare um in my experience but it's kind of thing that like bites you in the ass because you don't realize and so that's kind of annoying historically there's been a whole bunch of gotchas particularly with there was like the ordering of the operations i think was the the biggest gotcha ever but that's somewhat resolved but it's resolved and then as far as the community and the overall uptake of pi infra you mentioned that there has been some use of it and contributions from other users i'm wondering what the overall response has been from developers who first encounter and test out pi infra and your overall approach to trying to promote it or grow the community absolutely yeah it's been uh Responses have gen like been pretty good on the whole. Well, really good on the whole. Actually, I've been really, really pleased with people's feedback, and and kind of taken aback. Actually, I didn't really. It was it a it's part for kind of obviously been building it for years and using it, and then it appeared on Hacker News a couple months ago or something, and I uh, not submitted by me, which was really interesting. Actually, it was really nice to see. Really great feedback. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of glad to have it out there. I'm kind of working on plans as to promote it more. I think I haven't really done, I probably haven't done it justice at all, to be honest. I think I posted it on Hacker News a year or two ago and then, yeah, kind of sat on it, to be honest. I don't think I've put in, I think that's one where area I kind of lack when it comes to my open source projects, should we say, is what's promoting them, I guess. And I think part of that probably lends to kind of using it, using it professionally myself, so kind of haven't thought about you know, uh, where else it could be used, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, it's definitely easy to be focused on your own use case and overlook some of the potential other applications just because it's not something that you have had to deal with or a challenge that you're facing. And so that's definitely one of the great benefits of open source and making a tool available to other users is that it can allow for those new use cases to be discovered and factored into the tool, although it also ends up bringing in the challenge of having to know when to decline a contribution because as uh, one of my favorite adages goes you know open source is free as in puppy <laughs> that is very true uh yeah it's been it's been there's been some really interesting contributions recently on from kind of bsd bsd users because i always, always had be an open bsd in the vagrant vagrant test machine set but I never really used BSD firsthand, and, and certainly not as a daily driver. So I didn't really I'm kind of winging it, if you like. So it's been really interesting. I've learned a lot, you know, from other people contributing operations or, or improving operations within PyInfo. And uh, yeah, it's really exciting to see that. What are some of the other interesting or unexpected or challenging lessons that you've learned in the process of building PyInfo, or some of the complexities that you've had to deal with in its development? So I think for me, the most interesting thing has kind of been um, learning about all different systems, are uh, like different operating systems. Kind of, I kind of like I'm definitely an infrastructure nerd. I love, I just love infrastructure, technical infrastructure. But I think yeah, really interesting to like properly deep dive into that and, and play around with kind of various Linux distributions that I would never have used. Uh, BSD is another example. Yeah, stuff like that and and. I do, like I, I found that element of it really interesting, especially in the beginning when I was kind of figuring out what PyInfo would look like and what systems it would integrate with. And obviously the, the kind of guarantee then was just POSIX based systems. But now with the Win RM connector, I think the next interesting area is going to be kind of learning about kind of Windows remote management because I haven't used Windows in years. So that's going to be I'm really looking forward to kind of figuring that out. <laughs> I think the, the, yeah, there's a, I think the, the really interesting part of uh, developing PyInfo was the deploy file itself. So you've got, you know, you've got like you can store your operations in a in a file, a Python file, whatever it's called, and it, this is what's used to execute against the remote host. But uh, so the way it works is PyInfo will take this file and then for every single host in your inventory, it will execute the file. This essentially means that the file, what well, this means that the file is executed a whole bunch of times uh, once per host to generate that individual host's operations, which is all fine and well if you're, if it's just a series, simple series of operation calls. Where it became kind of complex was when you had conditional statements or for loops or any, anything like that. And you suddenly you'd have, depending on the order of the hosts in the inventory, you might end up with a different operation order because of these if statements. So that, you know, if you had the if at the top of the file, you wouldn't, that operation might not get seen as it were, by PyInfo until the second host, so it would get put afterwards. This is this is that was the original implementation. This is essentially a, a pend only every time it saw a new operation. So this this is obviously less than favourable. So I as I say, this is PyInfo's biggest issue over the years, and one that I solved late last year, I think. So the the second part of this, my well, second attempt at fixing this, was to um, implement kind of homebrewed control statements. So you'd have uh, instead of doing if you do like with state dot when so use context process or abused context processes to do it with state dot when and, and then the contents of your your if statement within there and then the same for loops but it was it was hacky but it worked it did the job but it meant it meant the, the python code in the deploy file wasn't just python anymore it was a weird you know it was python but with some weird control statements so my next approach about two years ago was to essentially compile the deploy files. So using the AST, uh, AST module, and then later, I think I used Red Baron for a bit, which is also fantastic. Use those to essentially take the user's deploy code, rewrite it with the context processor if statements, or swap if statements for context processors, and the same with loops, and then execute the file. And this actually, it actually worked really well for a long time, but I think the the kind of it, a it was slow, relatively slow to do all this compilation, and it did lead to some kind of edge cases over the years, especially because you're you're fiddling with other people's code essentially, and the, the, I think that just opens you up to like an infinite number of, kind of potential edge cases, which is which was resulted in some painful debugging sessions. 
And there's the, so to fix all of this, I basically pay for now, and this this is how it works. It uses it actually uses line numbers to order the operations. So as you it calls the deploy file, and then as it executes the file every time an operation is called, it, it's tracking those line numbers. And this happen this is ne- this happens in a nested manner. So if you include another file, it, it, it tracks the you know the file the line of include and then the line within the file included. Uh, and and it does exactly the same thing when you include like other people's package deploys. And that that is how Appliance does its ordering today. And it takes the kind of list of uh, operations and then operation lines and then uses it, it basically sorts them to come out with the final order. And it has the kind of nice effect of being like human understandable, if you like. You could you can if you I mean if you run it with debug, you can literally see the lines being printed out, but Basically, the way you would read the file is the way the operations now execute, which is kind of that was always the the kind of the ultimate goal for operation ordering, and it took yeah, it took best part of three years to get it kind of nailed down to where it is now. Yeah, it's funny how infrastructure kind of attracts a special kind of masochist who wants to be able to actually <laughs> deal with and handle all of these little edge cases that show up because of all of the slight variances in the systems that you're using and the different distributions of Linux and the package naming and how the file structures are laid out for people who want to deploy their code in different manners. So <laughs> exactly. as somebody who works in the space, I can commiserate with that. <laughs> For somebody who is considering what tool to use for building and managing their infrastructure, what are the cases where PyInfra is the wrong choice and they might want to just go with a Docker file or use one of the more full-blown configuration management frameworks like Salt or Ansible or something like that? Partly, there's definitely going to be cases where PyInfra doesn't doesn't have the, the necessary operations to, fu- to fulfill the, you know, the desired state. I think on the whole, I can't like I uh, think this is probably quite rare. I, obviously, ideally, Python is perfect in all of these use cases. Uh, one of its limitations certainly is kind of uh, would be the performance side. So I think as, as you reach kind of thousands, tens of thousands of, of targets, the kind of single uh, executing from a single host will, will be a you'll run out of CPU and, and network throughput at some point. So uh, kind of at that scale, I don't think I don't think Pyref is the right tool. Perhaps Python for agent might be at some point in the future. And then I think the other one is kind of continuous ensuring of state, which I believe Stolt does very nicely. Obviously, because Pyon for his agent list is not running all the time, and so it can't. It only runs whenever you run it, and you can hack that together by running a cron job on Jenkins or whatever. But that's you know, it's not the same as uh, having a daemon sat on the machine, making sure that things are constantly in the right state. Uh, Windows is the other one because uh, because Pyon was so new to WinRM, and, and it's you know really early days. Anything involving Windows, I, I would not recommend using Pyon for currently. For the future of the project, you mentioned a few different goals that you have, but what is your overall vision for where it's going to end up or anything that you are looking for help with contributions or feedback or anything as you continue to grow and build on the project? Yeah. So, the, I mean, the first, the initial big thing I want to get over the line is version one. It's no no real major change from a, an end user perspective, but it removes a lot of the kind of old craft that built up over those years of iteration, which is which will kind of give a, a much cleaner slate for building on top of Pyinfra, which I think is really important. I'm really keen on hearing the, the kind of feedback from the community on Pyinfra's APIs and, ha- and how Pyinfra is used in different contexts, because ideally it would be, you know, ideally it's like super easy to use, very accessible tool is, is the aim. I think the fact that it's configured in Python a little bit probably increases the bar for entry from something like a YAML based syntax, but I'm hoping the, the kind of examples and I would absolutely welcome and love people contributing any more examples, more just feedback on how it works, like anything like that. Super keen to improve the kind of the user-facing UI APIs. And then operation coverage is the other kind of area for expansion. I think there's there's still plenty of things that Pine for can't do or can't natively do and, and for which you might use like shell commands or old bash script for. And it would be nice to cover all of that. And the kind of the other thing, major thing is is with the upcoming version 1.1, hopefully with the stable API, I'm extremely keen to see you know how people use that. I like. I don't know what. I have no idea what that looks like. But I'm very interested uh, to see if and how people use it. 
Are there any other aspects of your work on PyInfra or the ways that you're using it for infrastructure management or just the overall space of configuration and infrastructure that we didn't discuss that you'd like to cover before we close out the show? I don't think so. Have you got anything? The only other thing that I wanted to call out is the fact that I think your approach to having everything be pure Python and the fact that that enables you to distribute deployment logic as a Python package and being able to compose things together and manage dependencies in that way is an excellent contribution to the ecosystem. So I appreciate that aspect of it. Thank you very much. (laughs) All right. That's it. Yeah. I hadn't thought of mentioning that, but yeah, you make a really good point. I think leaning on the built-in package management the Python offers and, and PyPy and setup tools kind of out of the box enables, yeah, like d- dependency management and, and bundling up a deploy as a, as a Python package is kind of a really nice feature if you like kind of sidesteps the need for, you know, custom implementation like Ga- Ansible Galaxy comes to mind, but, you know, there are others. Absolutely. Well, for anybody who wants to get in touch with you or follow along with the work that you're doing or contribute to PyInfra or your other projects, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And so with that, I'll move us into the picks. And this week, I'm going to choose a movie that I watched last night with the family called My Spy. Uh, just became available on Amazon and it was pretty hilarious. Just a uh, you know, great movie about a uh, bumbling CIA agent who ends up uh, embroiled with the targets who he's supposed to be surveilling. I'm not going to give any more of that away, but <laughs> definitely a lot of fun. Uh, so for anybody who's looking for something to watch, I recommend it. And with that, I'll pass it to you, Nick. Do you have any picks this week? Sounds great. Uh, yes, I picked up two things. One is tech, well, tech-ish, is my or the uh, DAS Keyboard Ultimate, which I would highly recommend to anyone. Um, I think the combination of mechanical keycaps and blank keycaps, mechanical keys and blank keycaps, is, is has dramatically improved my typing over the years. And Pi Infra is written on this very keyboard, or more <laughs> majority of it. And my other pick is a is completely unrelated. It's actually a food pick. There's a recipe which I can provide the link for I found it the other week for which we we made uh, and was extremely delicious is for Korean slow cooked Korean short ribs with kimchi fried rice highly recommend it all right definitely sounds like a interesting and enjoyable meal so I'll have to take a look at that so thank you again for taking the time today to join me and discuss the work that you've been doing with Pi Infra uh, it's definitely an interesting tool and one that I plan to take a closer look at and possibly use for some of my personal infrastructure I appreciate all the work that you've done on that and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day excellent thank you very much and thank you for listening thank you for listening Don't forget to check out our other show, The Data Engineering Podcast, at dataengineeringpodcast.com for the latest on modern data management. And visit the site at pythonpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the mailing list, and read the show notes. And if you've learned something or tried out a project from the show, then tell us about it. Email hosts at podcastinit.com with your story. To help other people find the show, please leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends and coworkers.